Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Portal, a 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swigert. This is the Amiga version. Now we're on episode 15, um, and a lot has happened, so I would encourage you to check out uh, the, the playlist for previous episodes if you want to catch up. Uh, but in essence, what happened last time, I believe, was that the uh, protagonists got to escape and the antagonists got sent off on a uh, floating block of ice so they shouldn't really be a current issue uh, in the story but whether that will work out in effect or not I don't know I can't foresee what would uh, prevent us from getting to the conclusion to the story rapidly um, but I also don't expect this to be the last episode judging by the pacing of um, this narrative so far. So if you haven't seen one of these before, um, what I'm doing here uh, is checking all the database categories for new entries to read, which will unlock, hopefully, uh, parts of the greater narrative, as told to us by Storytelling AI Homer. Ah, here we go. Terminus Sorel Report Summary. So Terminus is where we're supposed to be heading. Historical Cultural Data Link e Oh, now Homer's at it. Historical Cultural Data Link Entry. Terminus Sorel Report Summary. Record of Third Transantarctic Safari. January the 15th, 2012. Sudden the weather has been favourable with continuous sunlight, occasional high thin clouds and light winds. We have traversed the stretch of Sastrugi, for that sounds like a pastry, for the past four days, moving toward the pole of relative inaccessibility. Is that a real thing? That sounds strange. Our 12 all-terrain vehicles, crawlers, have performed beautifully. The new electrolytic refuelers have done well also. Toward noon, the lead ATV slid sideways unexpectedly, and we had to pull it out of a steep, though not deep, crevasse. While the rescue operation was underway, I decided to take a few days for a circuit of the vicinity. I had spotted what looked like an interesting noon attack in the distance, and wanted to do some radio-glaciological soundings near it, but as I approached it appeared to recede. Even triangulation with laser rangefinders produced ambiguous instrument errors. After two hours, my own crawler slipped against the Sastrugi and stopped. It looked as if I would have to stay here for a time, so I secured a tent and crawler and set out instruments. I had completed one pass of the ice when a storm came up suddenly. Gap in the record. The sudden storm ended, and I am now ready to return to the rest of the safari. I fear they will not believe me when I tell them about Terminus. Gap in the record. I found myself looking into an impossible abyss. The sunlight caught the tops of clouds below me, which parted, and below I saw what seemed to be a perfect dry valley underneath the ice. I spent several hours attempting to photograph this valley, which I have named Terminus. Although the photographs are of low resolution and nearly useless, <laughs> I personally swear that I could see vegetation, a lake fed by what appeared to be a river. I would assume some form of volcanic warming to this region. I would assume... Oh. Uh, with the river and lake fed by glacial melt. Okay, there's some. Uh, so it's kind of veering into like a lost world scenario, isn't it? Um, interesting. You know what? So let's. We need to look up these words, don't we? I'm going to um, make a conscious effort to use my notepad a little bit more. So let's look up what the Struki is. And a. Uh, None attack. So I'll have, what I'll do is I'll have a look in game because it would be these are not usual vocabulary words. So it'd be nice if um, the game itself provided some definitions for these. Um, in I guess geography, they both sound like geographical features. So let's try that. And if they don't, I will use the current modern day internet to to find out what they are. I think the picture, by the way, is just corrupted Homer. There he is. And Homer's flashing. I assume. Come to Homer. 
I have a file ready for you. Thanks, Emma. Yep, got it. Okay, let's have a look. Geography. You tell me about Sestrugi? You're not. Okay. Alright then, uh, into the end it is. Okay, so it appears a uh, Sestrugi is kind of like the snow equivalent of um, sand dunes. In that it's um, uh, shapes created out of frozen snow uh, due to wind erosion. And a nun attack is the summit of a mountain as it appears from a field of ice or a glacier. So, there you go, now we know. All right, um, so we know geography doesn't have anything for us, so let's try military again. That may have been, as Homer's so um, insistent now, that may have been the only thing we needed to, to look up, more information about Terminus. Which is unlocked just as the um, as the computer novel decides that we uh, we really can't go any further without finding out something about Terminus. Let's go back to life support. So I did um, one one great innovation I've employed since last time is actually use my notepad to record um, the last uh, character that we looked at the stats for from from the previous episode. So I'll, I'll use that to help us going forwards. So we, we last looked at Sarah Chan, so now we need to look at Shelley Jones to find out about them. Okay, Shelley Jones, uh, assigned female. Oh, okay. Born at, oh, born 26th of November 2055 and died 26th of November 2079. Um, I don't know if we've... Can I remember if we've encamped Shelley Jones in a previous bit of text uh, to know why why she died so young? Hmm. Anyway, this is uh, the blood pressure record there. This is temperature record, respiratory and GSR. There, heart rate and EEG. Tension. Tension rising there. Um, again, I don't know at what point in time in this person's life that all these readings were taken. Um, so they appear over a, I would guess, a short amount of time? Seconds, yeah, seconds. So there's only a few seconds worth of, of readings. So is it the the last extant moment of all of these characters, because although some of them don't have dates of death, I'd say the majority of the ones we've seen don't have dates of death, um, there are no evident living people on the planet, so something else probably happened to them. Okay, in Mossatch we also get some more stats, so let's have a look at Shelley Jones here. We get to see Shelley's family tree. There we go, so Shelley Jones is the child of Kay Jones and Mel Jones. Mel Jones is the child of Nina Jones and Frederick Jones. And Kay Jones is the child of Katie Nelson and David Nelson. Physiology and ESP. Look at there. Yep, yeah, there you go, there's your ESP and uh, one set of basic core IQ categories. There we go, a comparison. Then we'll head on to uh, psychology for even more stats. Shelley Jones. Okay, so in this one we're going to get a chart of emotional development. There we go. And one for personal growth. Here we are. 
and more basic core IQ. Yeah. Okay, and uh, then I believe we've got central processing up next. Uh, where occasionally we get a few little tidbits of uh, usually quite extraneous information, but it might still prove fundamental. Uh, nothing this time though, okay. Alright then, the last of Shelley Jones information, and then we're off to Homer for whatever Homer has to say. Went a little too far there. Uh, Shelley Jones, here we go. Alright, let's, let's start off with the basic core IQ when that loads in. There we are. Okay. Uh, the, so those are the final sets of, sets, of stats, sets of stats for those. And then memory graph, is it a graph? It's a bar chart, isn't it? A bar chart. And then social adjustment. There we are. And finally logic. Yeah, there you go. Um, low deductive reasoning, apparently. Okay. Alright, we're coming, Homer. Alright, what have you got to tell us? Um, narrative one. Are you going to tell me what a sastrugi is? The name Terminus is an ancient one. We find references in classical Roman writings, for example, of a god of that name, a, a elemental spirit of boundary markings. When the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus was built on the capital in Rome, the Terminus there refused to leave, and so was left inside the temple. Because the god had to be under the sky, the roof was left open. Terminus in Antarctica was a boundary marker of many kinds. It certainly meant a specific place, perhaps the last in the world so difficult of access, so obscure and distant. Finding Terminus would mean an end to the unknown places of the earth. It was also, of course, a boundary marker for the human race, for if Peter found it as he surely did, then the world would change forever, as it has. I find it intriguing that the temple of Jupiter had to be open to the sky. I have summaries from our historical analysis nodes, whose AI functions are not as advanced as some others, which suggests that Jules Sorel, when he named Terminus, had this fact in mind when he did the naming. Yet how could this be? The Earth has been surveyed by satellite down to the square metre, in most places to the square centimetre. Antarctica is not exempted from this coverage. All the data is stored and accessible. I can call up summaries of the Antarctic ice quite easily. Everything from colour at any time of day to temperature, chemical composition, magnetic alignment, density, percentage of impurities and so on anywhere on the continent. Nowhere is there a dry valley open to the sky called Terminus to be found. Yet Peter and the others had begun climbing up the Mullock Glacier. The storm was too severe for any kind of vehicle. We know from this weather satellite records and the accounts of the returning AEF. Yet storms, as they are in the Antarctic, were sudden and often brief. By the time the sun was hovering at its highest above the horizon for its fragile few hours at this time of year, the air was startlingly clear with broad flat clouds coloured a deep orange and red by the low sun. The ice and snow underfoot took on a dusky brownish hue. I feel some information on Antarctica appearing in SciTech. Okay, I'm not... We got any other little bits and bobs? Yeah, okay. RD, can I remember who RD is? Once, when they'd stopped for dinner and sleep, Peter began to talk. I remember 
I remember once we were all training, remember? Back in Lamprey Rec Centre, in the dojo. It was after Thatcher had come, and we were learning some of his techniques. We were meditating before the session, and I was looking down at the white mat. There'd been a group in there training before us, and there were small pools of water. Somebody sweat. They were perfect little pools, curled at the edges with surface tension. Not smeared around at all. Irregular shapes, like little upside-down lakes. Then out of nowhere came this ant. You mean the insect? Yes, strange, isn't it? How could the insect get into the Springfield West Warren? But ants, of course, burr into the ground, which is what we do as well. Ants, I suppose, have been doing it a lot longer than we have. I watched this tiny bug wander out onto the mat, an endless white plain from its point of view, and it came to one of those lakes, salt water. It must have been very strange to the ant to find this endless space with salt water lakes. And now we're the ants. Laren said. <coughs> that was um, interesting. Interesting. Um, not. Yeah. Um, maybe not the not the uh, most successful bit of uh, of scene setting that I, I've read in this uh, in this narrative so far. All right, so side take you were saying. All right, let's take another another run around. Okay, nothing there. Silink. Nope, nothing there. SciTech. None attack! Oh, SciTech. Oh, I hope we get a picture of a none attack. No, we don't need to get Homer's pixelated face. Okay. Uh, general science and technology information. Current entry, none attack. None attacks are hills or mountains completely surrounded by a glacier. In Antarctica, none attacks offer convenient landmarks, places to store food and supply caches or shelter. None attacks were used as entry ports for extended ice tunnels or under ice highways. Oh, okay, fair enough. That's the context in this world. Um... Is that the sole entry that you were directing me to to unlock more narrative? Because that was just a definition of something that I had expected to find in the geography and had to uh, had to look up outside the game to understand. I think perhaps the game, uh, if game it is, is expecting me to do this in less of a regimented fashion and to float around um, based more on the guidance available to me than sort of do a comprehensive sweep of each category sort of each between each part of the narrative um, and I guess it is making the experience longer for myself by doing it this way but I feel like You should be able to do it any way around and still be unlocking things. Um, it should still be, you know, a rewarding experience. Uh, whether, whether that's what this actually offers or not, I don't know. Uh, Melissa Alleman is our next person to, to read about. Okay, uh, Melissa Alleman. Uh, assigned female, born the 17th of March 2057. Let's have a look at Melissa's blood pressure. The last known blood pressure, possibly. Okay, and that was temperature. And then we're up for res res respiration, that was hard to say, and GSR. Heart rate and EEG. There we go. Tension. Oh, 
rising tension, DNA and hormones. There. Neurotransmitters. Glycogen. There. All right, let's go back to the main thing. I'll just take a second to. It's going to take a second to write down uh, Melissa Elliman's name on the notepad so I remember that's what we're doing. There we go, I'm going back to the game now. There we are. Uh, right, so we were on life support. Let's have a look at geography. No. So begrudging with its uh, information sometimes. Okay, here's Melissa. Back in Wasatch. So we should be able to see her family tree. Okay, Melissa Alleman. Uh, child of Anna Alleman and Henry Alleman, uh, who is the child of Laren Alleman and Arnold Alleman. I wonder if these names were procedurally generated because a lot of the same, uh, like Laren, has turned up as a first name uh, quite a few times in this story. Uh, Anna Alleman is the child of George Martin and Carrie Martin. Physiology and ESP. Go. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention, we're, we're doing basic core IQ now, and before that we did physio physiology and ESP. Um, I'm just inwardly contemplating the uh, the apparent heteronormality of uh, this future world that we're looking at. Okay, um, Melissa Allen in psychology. Okay, let's have a look at the emotional assessment. There we are. And then we will have a look at the personal growth chart. And then we'll have a look at a further four basic core IQ categories. There. Although there is some duplication, as I understand it. Um, back to the main menu. Um, then central processing. We've got the chance of something maybe slightly interesting. Only the faintest chance. No, no, so as home is doing this, um, I do find myself getting frustrated when we we get to a point where there's like a one-for-one -one information exchange, really. Um, you do one, you click on one entry and then home, uh, wants to tell you something, so you go to Homer, and then Homer says, oh, you need to go and read something else, really. Whereas, um, I mean, it's certainly extending the time with which I'm, I'm spending with this, so um, I think perhaps like the, um, this is basically core IQ, by the way, uh, perhaps like the, um, the sometime philosophy uh, of adventure games where they were obtuse just for the sake of game length that so you felt felt you got your money's worth um, and that was kind of a uh, an accepted um, convention between uh, players and designers uh, that was memory by the way we'll have a look at social adjustment so perhaps it's a bit like that as, if, as we're in that era um, the early early era of adventure games perhaps it was uh, yeah, thinking along the same lines, we need to draw this out so that they don't feel like they've uh, spent X amount of um, dollars or pounds or, or whatever local currency on a game that's over in a few hours. But if it's a good game, 
uh, then it's, it's probably worth it. That was some logic, by the way. Okay, so... Hopefully, we qualify for a bit more information now we've read about the attacks. At least one piece of information, okay. Go on then, serve it up, Homer. They were roped together, falling back on techniques that were hundreds of years old. They had small, field-driven sledges to carry equipment, but the fields were nearly useless on the glacier, which was riddled with crevasses and pressure ridges. This meant they had to haul the sledges by hand much of the time. It was slow, painful, difficult work. The temperature hovered around minus 35 degrees Celsius, and for these recently restructured ants, it was still unpleasant. Yet it was very beautiful. Peter called a halt near a rock outcropping. He rested his bare hand on the stone face for a moment. Many of these nun, or many of these nun attacks hold food and supply caches, some of them dating back a century or more. Old habits die hard, especially in an environment as harsh as this. You call this harsh? Laren asked, smiling. She indicated the blazing orange clouds, the shreds of milky blue sky, the many hued blues and greens of the ice, the dusky snow. The down of her upper lip was crusted with ice. Peter smiled back. Not at the moment, perhaps, but we are going into darkness. We have a trek of some 4,000 kilometres. That'll take, oh, at least three months, Rober calculated. Close enough, Peter agreed. Where are we going? Laren asked. The best projections I could get indicated the terminus. If it exists, Shem interrupted. If it exists, Peter agreed. It'll be somewhere in the vicinity of the pole of relative inaccessibility, that point on the high Antarctic desert furthest from all coasts. That makes it sound hard to reach, one of, one of the older women said. Do you want to go back? We've done the easy part of the trip across the Ross Ice to, to here. You could be back in 24 hours. She laughed. Absolutely not. I followed you this far. Things were not this interesting in Springfield West. Very well. There are places where the ice has been bored. Ice currents carry some of these bores in our direction. The route I've planned will allow us to use some of them, which means we will be travelling inside the ice. That'll be the easy part. Other times we'll be on the surface. The going is sometimes smooth, other times difficult. We're going to have to work together. It'll be very similar to the early days of exploration, except we have these caches. They ate and moved on. Progress was painfully slow, but a few standard days later, they reached the plateau. Before them was an endless sea with waves frozen in place. They're called Sestruki, Rover said. Unless we, unless we can laze openings in them, we've got to climb over. We climb, Peter said. We can't afford to melt our way across, only use lasers on the biggest ones. Permanent darkness fell. The hours of daylight had grown shorter and shorter, until one day the sun simply failed to appear. They had no use for polarising membranes now, and had to depend on their light intensifiers or glow lamps to see. They walked and climbed, and walked some more. Okay. So we got Sister Ugi in context there, which was nice. I know we have to find Terminus now, but we have found no records anywhere that could tell us where it is. So we have built some special probes, low-level flyers. They are searching now, crisscrossing the Great Desert. The winds are so violent they often blow the probes off course. It is so cold up there that circuits dry out as they freeze. There is almost no precipitation, nothing but wind and ice and blowing snow. Kilometre after kilometre of it. The flyers can stay above the Sestrugi, but if they go too high, they could miss Terminus. Something must hide it. 
I find that I must admire Peter and the others. Now that's an odd thing to say. It is not in our programming to admire. We were built to serve. I ordered central processing to build the probes. Central processing is very good at that sort of thing, I must admit. CP can process faster than any node. CP built probes unlike any built before. No human designed them. I should have noticed this before. We have been gradually doing new things. Things never seen before. I find that admirable as well. And Peter found Terminus, so we shall find it too. When we do find it, who can say what we will discover there? Surely Larin asked him once. What will we find at Terminus? Has no one ever been there at all? We don't know that. Peter would have said. We can't know that. We can say that if anyone has found Terminus, they have covered their tracks. There we go. So uh, Homer fictionalizing as he as he goes. So that's a pretty uh, good hint that we need to look at central processing next time we play the game. So let's do the last little bits of admin for a play session. I have written down the name of the last uh, character we've looked at, so that's good. Um, I just need to save actually. Well, let's have a little. We don't need to go in one of these categories, so let's have a little sneaky peek at central processing. T's next episode. Um, oh, there's nothing there. Home, are you tease? All right. Well, that wasn't much of a wasn't much of a cliffhanger. But let's save the game. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me for another episode. Uh, working our way through the narrative of Portal. Um, again, no idea at this point how many episodes um, before we get to a conclusion. Um, still curious as to what form that conclusion will take and what it will mean in the great context of the story. But I hope you're enjoying the experience and you will join me again for future episodes. Uh, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.